So my friends, thank you once again for tuning in to experience the word. It's that time again to experience the word and God's message for us tonight. This evening, we have a powerful worship experience. I mean, just awesome, inspiring experience. And we know that you're gonna be blessed. Friends of mine, we have a couple of things we wanna share with you. Number one, camp meeting is upon us. That's right. Southwest Region Conference Camp Meeting in Athens, Texas at Lone Star Camp. Beginning Wednesday evening, June the 15th through Saturday, the Sabbath, June 18th. We are gonna be blessed Great preaching, great singing, great fellowship, great food, great recreation, and our great God is going to be right there with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not too late. Put it on your calendar. Plan to join us at Lone Star Camp. For more information, give us a call. The number is 214-943-4491. Again, 214-943-4491. 4491 and you can learn more about camp meeting 2022 as we move southwest forward in fact let's show you a little bit about what's going to transpire at camp meeting this year and then we will return with a few more reminders camp meeting for the southwest region conference is taking place this year 2022 that's right to our members and friends in Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and beyond, you're invited to join us in person for this powerful spiritual experience that will take place at Lone Star Camp in Athens, Texas. Beginning Wednesday evening, June the 15th, and continuing through Saturday, June the 18th, plan to be at Lone Star Camp for soul-stirring preaching inspirational singing, heartfelt praying, social fellowship, swimming, horseback riding, basketball, great food, nature walks, and much more. Our special camp meeting guest speakers will include Pastor Henry Wright, Dr. Eric Thomas, Pastor Tricia Wynn Payne, and our very own Dr. Carlton P. Bird and Pastor Jason North. Our special camp meeting musical guests will include Grammy Award-winning gospel music artist Donald Morris, the International Choir of the World, the Oakwood University Aeolians, renowned songwriter and arranger Gail Jones Murphy, gospel music artist Myron Butler, and the inspiring voices of Decree. Additionally, for all musicians, choir members, and praise team singers. Please plan to join our Southwest Region Conference Camp Meeting Mass Choir under the direction of Donald Lawrence as we sing praises to our God. Choir rehearsal will begin Friday evening, June the 17th, immediately following the worship experience. There will also be workshops for family ministries, personal ministries, and women's ministries which will include practical presentations from guest television chef of the 3ABN Dare to Dream television network, Nice Collins. There will also be daily youth and children's programs, worship experiences, and activities. For more information, visit us at southwestregionsda.org. We look forward to seeing you at our 2022 Southwest Region Conference Camp Meeting. And together, let's move Southwest forward. Don't forget, we look forward to seeing you at Camp Meeting. God has been good to us. And for me personally, this was a powerful experience I had this week that I want to share with you. I had the privilege of going to Uvalde, Texas and praying with residents there praying with families of the victims who were lost in that horrible mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. I stood right there in front of Robb Elementary School, right at the site where second graders and third graders and fourth graders tragically lost their lives due to gunfire. I thought about our daughter, my wife and I, our daughter, 
our daughter who is now going to grade three, and I said, little ones just like her were lost in this tragedy. Friends, this evening, before we sing a song, before we preach a sermon, I want to call you to prayer. Prayer that I'm soliciting from you for the families there in Uvalde who have lost loved ones. Prayer for the community of Uvalde. In fact, walking up and down the streets, I was able to talk to different people, and you could sense uh, the grief and the sadness that's there. Wherever you are right now, I want to invite you to whisper a prayer for Uvalde. It's citizens, it's adults, it's young adults, it's youth, and it's children. We're going to continue now with Experience the Word, and we're going to be blessed with music ministry. Then after music ministry, yours truly will return, and we're going to preach the Word of God right here at Experience the Word.
for that music ministry. The music ministry we experience right here on Experience the Word. I don't know about you, but it blesses me. And praise God for our musicians. We want to get in the Word of God. And so if you have your Bibles, take them and turn with me to the book of Revelation. And we're going to Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to just one verse this evening. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to verse number eight, and I would like to read in your hearing, and I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Revelation chapter 14, verse number eight, the word of God says, and there followed another angel saying, 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This evening, we want to continue as we talk about now the second angel. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the first angel's message of Revelation 14. This evening, we now talk about the second angel's message of Revelation 14. But as is our custom, before we talk with you, let's talk with God. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we preach this, the second angel's message, we ask God for your divine guidance. Give us illumination and understanding that we might glean what we have just read from this text. And as we preach this word, may your word become alive. May the text become alive. And God, may we understand the seriousness of the times in which we live. So bless this word, bless the preacher, but not just the preacher, bless the hearers of this word. Go now through the technological airwaves, the internet airwaves, and uh, I pray that your spirit would move and penetrate the hearts and minds of your people. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The second angel of Revelation 14. The first angel of Revelation 14 is calling people back to worship the true God. Remember, the first angel says, fear God, glorify God, and worship God. Again, fear God, glorify God, and worship God. The first angel is then followed in the text by the second angel. And the fact that fact is because the second angel is referred to as the second one. And the second one is the second angel. And that second angel follows the first angel showing that their two messages are related. The message of the second angel of Revelation 14 is the complement to the angel first angel's message in that God is calling us back to true worship to him with the first angel's message. And the second angel's message tells us that in addition to worshiping God, we must reject all systems, reject all schemes, whether secular or religious, that are in opposition to God. So in other words, we are to worship God. That's angel number one. And then angel number two, we are to renounce anything in opposition to God. In other words, it's either God or Satan. It's either right or wrong. It's either truth or error. It was Jesus who said, no man can serve two masters. It was Elijah who said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. It was Joshua who said, Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So the first angel's message is fear God, glorify God, and worship God. The second angel's message is reject anything other than God. So the second angel begins its message and his message by saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Now, Babylon here is identified as a city, and we must admit that we have a bunch of great cities in our world today. We've got New York. We've got Los Angeles. We have Chicago. We have Washington, D.C. We have Atlanta, Georgia. We have Seattle, Washington. We have Dallas, Texas. We have Houston, Texas. We have Las Vegas. We have London and Paris and uh, Tokyo and Kingston, Jamaica and the Caribbean. We have Tokyo, Japan. We have Nairobi, Kenya. We have all these cities. We have all these people in these cities and these cities have famous places, but they also have sin. Babylon was a city. Babylon had people. Babylon had famous places, and Babylon had sin. But in this text, let me share with you that we're not talking about literal Babylon, but this evening we're talking about figurative Babylon. 
Babylon, in this context to which we preach tonight, is the end time worldwide religious coalition that stands against God and God's people. Babylon represents all those plans and all those programs that attempt to frustrate God's divine plan for the world. Babylon is a religious system that stands in opposition to the gospel that is backed by the political powers of this world. The nations of the world, they associate themselves, if you will, with Babylon for the purpose of perceived economic security and prosperity, but soon they will experience God's wrath. Soon their power will come to an end. Why will it come to an end? Because at the end of the day, I'm so glad that my God's got the last word. I wish I had a worship to witness tonight. Now, remember that the first angel says the gospel is everlasting. But the second angel says that Babylon is fallen, which means Babylon is not everlasting. Babylon is short-lived. Babylon is temporary. Babylon is not permanent. And just like the old prophet, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah proclaimed in Jeremiah 51, 8, that Old Testament Babylon, that ancient city had fallen and been broken. The second angel of Revelation 14 announces the collapse of end time figurative Babylon. So literal Babylon falls. And then the Bible says end time figurative Babylon is also going to fall. The angel says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Now, you need to understand that Babylon comes from the root word Babel or Babel. And Babylon means confusion. And in this sense, it means spiritual confusion. Remember, if we're saying that Babylon comes from the word Babel or Babel, that is to take us back to the Old Testament. And you remember the Tower of Babel. And you remember the children of Israel. Remember, they were seeking to reach heaven. So they built a tower. But it was not the will of God for them to build a tower to reach heaven. And so we recognize that what did God do? God confounded them by language. And because they all began to speak different languages at the same time, they could not understand one another. So at the Tower of Babel, they're trying to build a tower to reach God. This is not God's will. God confounds them by language. They all start speaking different languages. And when everyone speaks at the same time, and when everyone especially is speaking a different language at the same time, we have confusion. So at the Tower of Babel, there was confusion. Babel is the root word for Babylon, which means confusion. But in this sense, spiritual confusion which means in time Babylon will promote spiritual confusion. In time Babylon will promote lies. In time Babylon will promote falsehoods. In time Babylon will promote deception. In time Babylon will try to make you think that God's true people are wrong when in actuality, God's true people aren't wrong, but Babylon is wrong. The text says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon then made all nations participate in her foolishness. What am I talking about? Let's go and stay in Revelation, but let's go to Revelation 17. And let's go to Revelation 17, verse number one. Revelation chapter 17 and verse number one. The Bible says in Revelation 17, verse number one, and there came out of the seven angels, which had the seven vows, and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. All right, let's stop right there. Now, many people would read this text and they will say, well, what is this talking about Babylon, uh, the great? And what, what is this talking about this whore that sitteth upon many waters? Let's make sure that we understand that Revelation is a prophetic book. And because Revelation is a prophetic book, there are prophetic symbols and names in Revelation that have literal meanings, if you understand what I'm trying to say. When the Bible talks about a woman in Bible prophecy, a woman represents in Bible prophecy a church. 
A woman, once again, represents a church in Bible prophecy. The text says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, we recognize that a whore is a woman. And we also recognize that a whore is not a good woman. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the Bible is saying this bad woman or this bad church, because a church is represented by a woman in Bible prophecy, this bad church sits on many waters. What does waters represent? I'm so glad you asked. Water represent in Bible, represents in Bible prophecy. Water represents people. What am I talking about? Stay in Revelation 17 and go to verse number 15. The Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sowest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the Bible is saying that water in Bible prophecy represents people. The Bible says a great whore sat upon many waters, which means then this woman and a whore is a bad woman. So this bad church sat on top of many people. Verse number two of Revelation 17, the Bible says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Remember now, fornication means, if you will, immorality. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Fornication means immorality. Wine, in this case, means teachings. We're going to come back to that. Verse two, once again. This woman, this bad woman, this bad church with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, which is immorality, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They have been made drunk. Wine means teachings. Verse number three. So he carried me away, the Bible says. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Verse number four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, when you read that, we need to unpack verse number five. Again, upon her forehead, upon Babylon's forehead was a name written, mystery, Babylon, spiritual confusion, the great, the mother, women, that means a church, the church of harlots, the mother of harlots, harlots, bad woman, the mother then of bad churches and abominations of the earth. Now, let's expand our minds a bit. Understand that this mother church, if you will, this mother church sat on many people and this mother church uh, was the mother of all, if you will, false or bad churches. Now stay with me here because I'm talking about Bible prophecy. When we study history, we recognize that the Roman Catholic church is the mother church. Let me say it again. When we study history, we recognize that the mother church is the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church sees itself as the mother church. If you go to any denomination, if you go to any faith group, and they read and recite the Apostles' Creed, at the end of the Apostles' Creed, they pay homage, if you will, or respect, if you will, to the mother Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church sees itself as the mother church. Dr. Byrd, how does that work? Well, remember, the Roman Catholic Church sees itself as an extension, if you will, of the New Testament church. In fact, the mother church, the Roman Catholic Church, sees itself that just after Jesus' death, just after his resurrection, it sees itself as the New Testament church, and they identify the apostle Peter as their first pope. They see Peter as the first pope. What am I talking about? Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to verse number 18. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to verse number 18. It sees itself as the mother Catholic church. The mother church it does. The Roman Catholic church. And Peter as its first pope. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16 verse number 18. And I say unto thee, Jesus himself speaking... 
that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the mother church, the Roman Catholic church, sees itself as an extension of the New Testament church. Understand they see Peter as the first pope because when they read this text, they interpret this text that the church, if you will, was be built on Peter. Peter, by definition, means Petros. It means rock. But the Roman Catholic Church got it wrong. Jesus was not saying in the text that the church is built on Peter. Jesus was saying in the text that the church was built upon himself. The church was built upon Christ Jesus because on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. They went wrong in the beginning thinking that the church was built on Peter, but the church wasn't built on Peter, but the church was built on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. But we see throughout history that the Roman Catholic Church, it saw its church self as the mother church and all the churches were to come under it. All the churches were to listen to what the mother church, the Roman Catholic Church said. But understand that something transpired in the year 1517. Something transpired in the year 1517 when a gentleman by the name of Martin Luther, he says, wait a minute, there are things that the mother church is telling us we ought to do. There are things that the mother church is telling us we ought to abide by that are not in scripture. And Martin Luther used to then advocate a phrase or a saying in Latin, which was sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura, the scriptures and the scriptures alone. In other words, Martin Luther is saying that there are some things in the word that the Catholic Church is not abiding by. There are some things that the Catholic Church, the mother church is advocating that are not in the word of God. And someone knows if it ain't in the word, it does not deserve to be heard. I wish I had a witness on this, this call, this experience the word tonight. So Martin Luther says, wait a minute. There are teachings that are not in harmony with the word of God. One of those teachings was indulgences. And these were when you paid money to receive forgiveness of sin. Well, the mother church was trying to raise money because they were trying to build a new cathedral. And so what they told people was, if you have sin, in order to receive forgiveness of sin, you have to pay indulgences. You have to pay money. And there was a gentleman who was the treasurer of the church back in those days by the name of Johann Tetzel. T-E-T-Z-E-L. Go check it out. Go look it up. Go Google Johann Tetzel. And Johann Tetzel was the treasurer, and he was telling people, in order to receive forgiveness from sin, you have to pay money. Martin Luther says, wait a minute. That's not in the word of God. Why is the mother church teaching that? We don't need to abide by that because that's not in God's word. And again, if it's not in the word, it does not deserve to be heard. Martin Luther said, why do we have to pay? money for forgiveness of sin when 2,000 years ago Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow I don't have to pay for forgiveness from sin Jesus already paid it all for me on Calvary but Jesus we understand that through this schism if you will Martin Luther says listen I can no longer do it it must be the scriptures and the scriptures alone Martin Luther begins to protest against the abuses of the mother church, protest against the abuses of the mother Catholic church. And so as a result of his protest, he nailed 95 theses or 95 statements against the door of the church there in Wittenberg, Germany, W-I-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, nailed them to the door of the church in Wittenberg, protesting against the abuses of the mother Roman Catholic Church. Now, in those days, that was a big deal. You didn't go up against the church. You did not speak evil against the church. You did not speak anything contradictory of what the church taught. If the church said it, that was it. But Martin Luther says, I answer to a higher power. I answer not to man, but I answer to God. And God's word is not saying that you have to pay money to receive forgiveness from sin. Martin Luther nails 95 statements against the door of the church of Wittenberg. And these protests, if you will, these statements, if you will, 
protesting against the mother Roman Catholic Church, then began to form the genesis of what we now know as the Protestant Reformation because Martin Luther was protesting against the mother church. And so we have now out of the protest, the Protestant Reformation and the Protestant church is started. So you have mother church over here, but then you have the Protestant church over here protesting against the mother church. And under the Protestant church here, you have all these churches that are now formed. You have the Baptist church, the Lutheran church, the Wesleyan church, the Presbyterian church, eventually the Seventh Day Adventist church. You have all these Protestant churches protesting against the abuses of the Mother Catholic Church. But if I had been living in 1517, I would have said, Brother Luther, I'm with you. I hear what you're saying. We answer to God and not man. It's all about answering to divinity and not humanity. But Martin Luther, what about the Sabbath? What are we going to do about the Sabbath? Because they that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. God is calling for true worshipers today. It must be truth over tradition. And God is a God of truth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God's word says, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And the first angel says, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. But the word of God has some more in the second angel. The second angel says, Babylon, spiritual confusion is fallen. And because Babylon is fallen, you better get out of Babylon because Babylon made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Go to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18, and we're going to verse number one. Revelation chapter 18, and we're going to verse number one. The word of God says in Revelation 18 verse one, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The Bible is clear. The Bible is saying that Babylon is fallen, and Babylon has made all nations drink the wine of her fornication. What is the wine again? The wine is teachings. Now, I've never drunk in my life. I've never had a beer in my life. I've never had a 32 ounce or a 40 ounce or a sip of champagne in my life. But I'm told when you drink wine, I'm told when you drink strong drink, I'm told when you drink a lot of it, you get drunk. And when you get drunk, you can't think right. When you get drunk, you can't walk right. When you get drunk, you don't understand right. And understand the Bible is saying that these nations are following mama, mother church. These nations are following mama and mama has made them drink her teachings. She has made them drink her wine and because they have drunk her wine, because they have drunk her teachings, they are now stumbling at the truth. They now can't think right. They now can't walk right. They now can't understand right. What are some of Babylon's teachings? Well, one of them we already went over. One of them is indulgences to pay money in order to receive forgiveness from sin. We don't return money to the church to receive forgiveness of sin. Jesus has already forgiven us of our sins. We return money to the church because the word of God has told us thou shalt not steal. The word of God has told us to return tithe and offering into God's church, God's storehouse. So we return tithe, we return offering, we give money to the church, not to receive forgiveness of sin, but we return money to the church because we're being obedient to God and because we love God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But that's one of mama's teachings. Return indulgences, return money in order to receive forgiveness of sin. But Jesus already has forgiven us of our sins. Jesus has already washed us 
clean from our sins. Jesus has already paid it all. I don't pay money to get forgiveness from sin. I pay money because I obey God and I love God. But another one of mama's teachings that makes people stumble at God's truth. Sunday sacredness. That's right. There's nowhere in scripture where it says Sunday, the first day of the week is the Sabbath. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. Remember the seventh day Sabbath to keep it holy. The Bible doesn't say the first day, but the Bible says the seventh day. The seventh day Sabbath. But the sad thing is, because mama has made nations, and mama has made her daughter churches drink the wine, drink the Kool-Aid, if you will, drink these teachings, when this man of God stands up and preaches that the seventh day is God's Sabbath, then people think, I'm crazy, but I'm not crazy. I haven't drunk the wine. I haven't drunk the teachings. I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid. I am just standing on the word of God because if God said it, that settles it. I'm standing on the word of God. I'm obedient to God's word. And why am I obedient to God's word? Because I love God. But because mama has made her daughters and mama has made the nations drink her wine and drink her teachings, men, women, boys, and girls are stumbling, if you will, at the truth. The Bible doesn't say anywhere where God changed his divine law from Saturday, the seventh day Sabbath, to Sunday, the first day of the week. In fact, in that command, because God knew someone would try to change his law, God begins not with thou shalt keep the Sabbath, but God begins with the word remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But man is drunk. What's another one of mama's teachings? Another one of mama's teachings is that when you die, you go straight to heaven. But the Bible doesn't say that. But because mama has made her nations and mama has made her churches drink the wine, people are confused at the truth. And so they think that when a person dies, they go straight to heaven or go straight to hell. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that when a person dies, the body returns to God, the body returns to the ground, the spirit, if you will, the breath returns to God and the soul ceases to exist. The truth of the matter, my friends, is that people who have died can't already be in heaven because if they were in heaven already, who would Jesus be coming back at his second coming to get? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If the righteous were already in heaven at their death, who would Jesus be coming back for at his second coming? There would be no need to come back because everybody would already be in heaven. But mama wants you to drink its wine. Mama wants you to drink its teachings and be confused at God's truth. But it doesn't stop there. Mama would have you to believe that there is a purgatory, but there is no purgatory. There is no intermediate state between heaven and hell. The Bible is very clear in Revelation 22. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man and woman according as their work shall be. Mama would have you to think infant baptism is okay. But the Bible says in order for one to be baptized, Matthew 28, 19 and 21 must first be taught. Then the Bible says in Mark 16, 16, that one must believe. And then in Acts 2, 38, the Bible says that in order for one to be baptized, one must repent. A baby can't be taught. A baby just knows goo goo gaga. A baby can't repent. A baby has done no wrong. A baby can't believe because a baby doesn't know what's going on. But mama would have you to think that a baby can be baptized. The Bible doesn't say that. But the Bible does say something to the little children to come unto me and forbid them not because they too have a place in God's kingdom. So we can bless and pray for babies. But the Bible doesn't say anything about baby or infant baptism. But that is some wine that mama wants you to drink. But in the name of Jesus, the devil is a lie. In the name of Jesus, the devil is the father of lies. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to believe the devil. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I will not be deceived by the devil. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And I heard verse four of Revelation 18. 
I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Tonight, I'm not trying to tell somebody, come out of Babylon. Tonight, I'm trying to tell somebody, don't try to change Babylon. I'm trying to tell somebody, don't try to reform Babylon. But in the name of Jesus, the word is clear. Come out of Babylon. God has not called you to try to reform a church. God has called you to come up out of that church. The Bible says, come out of Babylon. Now, remember, we're not talking about a literal city, but we're talking about a system. We're talking about a religious and a political system that is in opposition to God and will seek to overthrow God and God's people. Now, I'm not here to discuss your political persuasion. I'm not here to discuss whether you're Democrat or Republican or independent. I'm not here to discuss who you're voting for, but I am here to see, we are seeing and witnessing and experiencing right now, vestiges of political systems lining up with religious systems. We can slowly in our world see the union of church and state. We can see nations drinking the wine of the woman, nations drinking the wine of the mother church. We can see that the popularity of the Pope, the papacy of the mother church is at an all time high. Believers of God, lovers of Jesus, understand tonight, prophecy is coming to pass. Systems are lining up right now in opposition to God. Apostate religion is showing its ugly head. Nations will align to overthrow the kingdom of God. Morality is falling. Coronavirus is here. Gas prices are out of control. People are being shot each and every day. But in the name of Jesus, Babylon will fall. God's truth will win out. And this preacher is trying to tell you, come on out of Babylon. I want to close, but my soul is getting happy right now. Because all throughout scripture, whether systems and nations, whether they try to overthrow God, the Bible always lets us know that they will lose. From Pharaoh and Egypt to Jezebel and Ahab, whenever systems and nations go up against God, they lose. And most times in scripture, whenever God wage war against another nation, God will use one nation to overthrow another nation. But in the end, when God destroys the apostate religious systems and nations against him, he's not going to use another nation. But God is going to say, I got this one myself. God is going to do it himself. We already have an example of this from God's battle against Pharaoh in Egypt. Let's digress and go there for a minute. God did not reach out and get another nation to fight Egypt. God fought Egypt, hallelujah, himself. Remember, Egypt was the superpower of its era. Egypt built pyramids and buildings that are still existing today. Egypt had the greatest military of its day. Egypt had 600 chosen chariots. Egypt had technology and armaments. Egypt had swords and shields. Egypt had horses and chariots. Egypt had finances and resources. Egypt, but you know what? My God didn't need any of those things. God didn't need the Israelite army. God didn't need another nation to fight Egypt. God fought Egypt himself. And the amazing thing about my God tonight is that when God gets ready to fight, God will use things you never thought about. God will use things I never thought about. Who would have ever thought of releasing boils against their enemies? Only God could clap his hands. Only God could stomp his feet and cause boils to break out on the backs of his enemies. God walked out to the ponds there in Egypt and God spoke to the frogs and God said, Froggy, hop on over into Egypt. I'm going to forge a frog attack that they have never seen before. God looked at some flies and he looked at those flies and called for the flies to descend upon Egypt. When God wages war, I am a witness that when God wages war against you, you are in trouble. 
I'm tired of hearing what the enemy's got. I'm tired of hearing, hearing what military superpowers have got. I'm tired of hearing what the U.S. has. I'm tired of hearing what Russia has. I'm tired of hearing what North Korea has. I'm tired of hearing what China has. I'm tired of hearing the saints talk about unemployment and inflation. I'm tired of hearing the saints talk about sickness and disease. I'm tired of hearing the saints talk Talk about COVID and cancer. I'm tired of hearing the saints talk about wildfires and hurricanes. I'm tired of hearing about all these shootings. Buffalo, Uvalde, and Tulsa. But in the name of Jesus, I came to tell somebody that you don't have to wait till the battle is over. You can shout now because in the end, God is going to win. God is going to defeat Satan once and for all. God defeated Satan in heaven. He defeated Satan in Bethlehem. He defeated Satan at Calvary. He defeated Satan at the resurrection. And he's going to defeat him at the second coming. And he's going to then defeat him at the end of the millennium. Where every knee is going to bow. Every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan is defeated. God is going to win. Some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots. But I'm so glad I can trust in God. Lift up your hands, O ye gates. I said, lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is the King of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. I will remember the name of the Lord. So hurricanes are coming. Plagues are coming. Storms are coming. Trials are coming. Tests are coming. Tribulation is coming. War is coming, but we will win. In fact, we've already won. We won at Calvary. We don't fight for Calvary. We fight from Calvary. So the devil better back up right now. COVID better back up right now. Cancer better back up right now. Leukemia better back up right now. Sick of cell better back up right now. Arthritis better back up right now. Heart disease better back up right now. Fear better back up right now. Depression better back up right now. Bankruptcy better back up right now. Depression better back up right now. Gossip better back up right now. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. Angel number one, fear God. Glorify God. Worship God. For the hour of his judgment is come. And angel number two is telling us tonight, Get out of Babylon. Don't drink the wine of Babylon. Don't drink the teachings of Babylon, but come out of Babylon, my people. That's the message of the second angel. Come out from among her. Come out of Babylon. Tonight, man, woman, boy, girl, who's ever watching right now? In a church, not in a church. In the church, not in the church. Whoever you are, my appeal to you is to come out of Babylon. Jesus is soon to come. The signs are everywhere all around us. I want to see Jesus. Don't you? He's my Savior. So faithful and true. I want to see Jesus. Don't you? In order for us to see Jesus, we've got to come out of Babylon. Father, we've heard your word. And we thank you for speaking to us today. You've never fought a battle that you would fight and lose. In the name of Jesus, fight our battles today. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that those watching, those listening, that God, they come out of Babylon. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for being with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you once again for tuning in to Experience the Word. I do hope you were blessed by the Word of God this evening. Before we close, don't forget, don't forget camp meeting at Lone Star Camp, 
They're in Athens, Texas, June 15th through June 18th. Don't forget to pray for the residents of Uvalde, Texas. But don't stop with Uvalde. Include Buffalo and include Tulsa, Oklahoma as well, as a mass shooting took place in Tulsa just this week. Don't forget, my friends, that this is a donor-dependent ministry. Experience the word. We need your prayers, but we need your financial support so that each and every Friday evening, we can share God's love through God's word with you. How can you donate? It's very simple. You can donate and remit your charitable gift in one of four ways. Number one, you can mail your gift to us at the Southwest Region Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, 2215 Lanark Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75203. Again, 2215 Lanark Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75203 and label on your check, label on your gift in the memo section, moving Southwest forward. You can also remit your gift via telephone. Give us a call. The number is 214-943-4491. Again, 214-943-4491. You can also remit your gift electronically. Cash App, our handle is dollar sign SWRGC. Again, dollar sign SWRGC. And finally, you can remit your gift online via our website, southwestregionsda.org. Go to our website, click on the giving prompt, follow the directions, and remit your gift through Moving Southwest Forward. Finally, don't forget, we're looking forward to seeing you next Friday evening, same place, same time, as we experience the world. <laughs>